Okay, so this is a presentation around Marxism and medicine. Um, really what it is, is a materialist approach to curriculum studies. This is kind of my, you know, my contribution that I'm, I'm hoping to make. So who am I? Um, I'm, I'm Leo, I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Winchester in Britain. Um, I started my PhD knowing that I wanted to bring Marxism to medical education. Uh, I didn't know exactly sort of what form that would take. Um, only I could see the effects of capitalism on health. And I saw how unequipped medicine is to handle them um, in any meaningful way. Um, I saw how my how medicine had repeatedly failed my trans and queer friends, my disabled friends, even more so my trans and disabled friends. Um, and I knew this issue was likely to be illuminated by considering the mode of production, capitalism, but I didn't know exactly how I would attempt that analysis. Um, and in this presentation, I'm going to be exploring what I ended up doing um, and how I'm attempting to kind of bring Marxism to uh, medical education and how this might illuminate a path forward towards um, liberation. So an important note, this is a work in progress. This is part of my PhD. I was second year PhD student. Um, uh, some of this thinking is definitely still developing. Um, I really welcome thoughts and criticisms at this point. I welcome that at any point, but um, I definitely welcome them at this stage. Um, you know, if anyone spots anything that I've missed or anything that kind of feels deeply unhelpful or deeply incorrect, um, you know, sort of please, please do let me know. I'm, I, I really welcome um, those contributions and any other questions that you have. So let's begin. So what's the problem? The problem is that what I'm setting out here, the medical curriculum sets out what doctors in Britain have to know and how they have to demonstrate that knowledge before they're allowed to engage in independent medical practice. Um, this curriculum is constantly under contestation and development. It's, curriculum is often a site of struggle and the medical curriculum in Britain is, is no different to that. Um, there are huge amounts of contestation and struggle over this curriculum. But despite this almost constant contestation and curriculum development, um, the oppression, discrimination and harm experienced and caused through medical practice continues. Um, and I want to know why. I want to know why that is. Um, I'm sure that many people here have experienced all kinds of kind of unpleasant and harmful experiences with doctors. In last month's presentation, we were talking about how doctors will often speak to personal assistants rather than to disabled people themselves. There are loads of examples of this kind of thing. I mean, we can all think of them, um, how, how sort of medicine in Britain um, is just unequipped really to deal with, to deal with um, the, the lives and the lived realities of, of many people. Um, and specifically turning to the problem relating to disability, which is that medicine still overwhelmingly understands disability through the medical model, um, which I mean, you know, the clues in the name, it's medicine, it's the medical model. Um, and a medical model, I'm sure everyone here is aware, but it's, it places the disabled person as a problem in need of fixing. There have been attempts to integrate the social model into the medical curriculum, which sort of turns that round somewhat and suggests that the people are disabled, people are disabled by barriers created by society and um, not by their impairments. And so any changes we want to make should be located within society, not within the individual. So there have been attempts to kind of integrate that social model more into the medical curriculum, but these have been very largely unsuccessful. I'm sure that there are some examples of some places beginning to integrate this a little bit more, but on the whole, it's been not a success. So I really started out my research by thinking, by being interested in this question of why these and other similar, you know, lots of kind of similar attempts to reform the medical curriculum, um, why these attempts fail. Like what is the constraint? What is actually going on that means that this curriculum um, can't, can't adapt, can't, can't change? So, you know, my attempt at ex an explanation is uh, the problem is capitalism. Um, so there we go, uh, finished, fixed it. Let's all go home. Um, so in my PhD, I have to spend quite a lot of time arguing that capitalism as an economic system is in fact of utmost importance when considering social relations. Um, this is one of the things that I've had to spend a lot of time sort of sort of arguing about and, and putting forward. Um, I think that in this forum, I, I don't have to spend so much time on that question in particular. Um, but in summary, the kind of position that I'm starting from is that 
our consciousness is shaped by our material conditions, you know, the experiences that we have in the course of living. Um, I don't want to kind of fall into this trap of being economistic. Um, I'm not giving a kind of mechanically materialist account of oppression. I don't think that every form of oppression that is experienced under capitalism is ultimately entirely reducible to economic exploitation, but it is of great importance that considering this mode of production uh, is the kind of argument that I'm making. In fact, Marx, in the contribution to the critique of political economy, explains that in exploring the transformation of society, it's, it's not enough to just to consider the economic situation, but also to consider the legal, political, religious, artistic, and philosophic or ideological forms in which people become conscious of that conflict and fight it out. So the way that this is experienced in medicine, in science, the sort of oppression that we're looking at here is of utmost importance when we're considering how we want to transform society how we might want to look at transforming society in the future. So I can't just write capitalism, obviously, I have to actually say something else. So what I'm saying is, what I'm offering really is a dialectical materialist analysis of the medical curriculum. So it's an understanding of how medicine and medical education functions within capitalism, and specifically how medicine understands the effects of capitalism on health. Um, I'm, I chose Marxism, I chose dialectical materialism because it's this great combination of, of science, critique, vision, re revolution. Um, obviously these qualities are all kind of entwined in constant throughout Marx's work. It's kind of in this manner that I'm approaching dialectical materialism um, as this methodology and this praxis for liberation. Um, and I, I, I want, I love that dialectics allows me to see the present as transitory. You know, where, what are we passing through this moment that we're passing? Where is it going? Um, if we can thoroughly understand the development at this moment, I, I believe we have the capacity to change it. And that's really what I'm attempting to do here. OK, so this is the question that I'm asking and the one we're going to explore today. So how does the medical curriculum understand the effects of capitalism on health? Um, in the non-Marxist literature, this is usually these are usually referred to as the social determinants of health or health inequalities. Um, and the effects of those as, as health inequalities. Um, yeah, they can include things like uh, class, geography, education, ability, race, ethnicity, gender. These are this is generally how the literature kind of refers to these. So if you're ever reading the literature, um, the social determinants of health are, as you probably know, the effects of capitalism on health. So what did I do? I did this. Um, I started off by analyzing curriculum documents. So at this stage of my research, I've been reading a lot of curriculum documents from places like the Royal College of General Practitioners, the Royal College of Physicians, the British Medical Association, General Medical Council. Um, I'm using a dialectical materialist method to analyze them. But before I kind of get to that, I want to set out my, my theoretical framework. Um, the second half of my study, which is ongoing, is uh, interviews with GPs, asking them about their practice and about their, how they sort of how they understand um, health inequality, how they understand the effects of, of capitalism on health. So, in this presentation, I'm going to explore first of all what is the curriculum and how it's enacted, what is the function of medical practice, and then how and can how can and should these things change. OK, so the medical curriculum, as I said at the beginning, the medical curriculum sets out what doctors have to know in order to be allowed to engage in independent medical practice. Curriculum studies in medical education tends to take a documentary and technocratic view of the curriculum. So what this means is that generally the curriculum is understood as a document that exists. So you can go and find the curriculum. It might not all be at one time or in one place or in the same document, even on the same piece of paper, but you could go and look at it. There is somewhere a curriculum written down and that's, that's the kind of the understanding of the curriculum document. So there's this sense contained within that of linear development. So you make an educational design and then eventually that is translated to action and finally to an educational outcome. There's a sense of development from this educational curriculum design um, to action, to outcomes. And the curriculum is seen as this document that has the ability to guide educational practice. And so in the case of medicine, the curriculum is seen as a document that has the ability to shape 
doctor's values and, and practice. Because the document is understood as, the, because the curriculum is understood as a document, this inevitably leads to design as a mechanism of curriculum change. If you want to make a new curriculum, if you want to change the medical curriculum in some way, what you do is you find the document, you, find, you make a committee, you change that document, and then you do some new teacher training. That is how generally in medical education, curriculum and curriculum change is understood. So as we'll talk in a minute, these are efforts tend to lead to minor reforms and incremental change because the curriculum is only partly, if at all, a curriculum in a document. Um, and really not much can be done with this method as attempted reformers of the medical curriculum have repeatedly discovered. There have been attempted reforms of this curriculum through this method for simply, at this point, probably get nearly a century or more than a century, and it doesn't have revolutionary change. So what I'm arguing is that this is an idealist error. So this understanding of the curriculum leads to this idealistic conception of the curriculum where it is split into these constitutive parts. So the curriculum on paper is this curriculum document as written down. The curriculum in action is this document that is the way that it gets delivered. And the hidden curriculum is all the rest. So the hidden curriculum is all those things that you know the experiences of learning, spending time in the classroom, all that stuff that you kind of can't control and can't can't write down and can't plan for. And generally, the hidden curriculum is considered to be bad, and the other two are considered to be good, very broadly. But I think this is, you know, this just sounds like idealism to me. You know, you, how can you split up this thing that's happening? How can you split it into these parts and say that the three are not related? Um, and what I kind of realized as I read curriculum theory was that splitting the curriculum into these supposedly constitutive parts was an attempt by bourgeois or non-Marxist theorists to account for the effects of society on the curriculum. So they knew, like these theorists know that society has an effect on the curriculum. That's what the hidden curriculum is. And so what this led me to is, okay, we need to do a materialist approach to curriculum studies. We have to take a material look at this. How can we look at this materially rather than looking at this in an idealistic sort of way where we split it up? So the curriculum is not a document, it's a practice. This is a dialectical view of curriculum. It is created, constructed, and realized within the practice of teaching through the day-to-day -day interaction of teachers and students. In this next section, I'm drawing on the work of Catherine Cornbleef. She is a wonderful theorist who is just utterly wildly engaged, wildly underengaged with. It's it's very sad, certainly in medical education. She is a really great theorist, I think. Um, and I'm thoroughly indebted to her, to her laying the groundwork for this. Um, I really recommend her work. But what I'm doing here is saying that this is, um, there's not a causal, causal sequential relationship between design and implementation, but rather these features are all in relation to each other. And crucially, they are all in relation to the wider political and cultural context. So this is resisting this technocratic view of curriculum which is one that assumes that the aims of education can be caused by educational experiences that have been specified. So, you know, you specify the aims and then you go ahead and teach it. This is the kind of technocratic, technocratic view. And you describe these things in advance and then you do them. Um, what I'm saying is this, um, this is not the case, that these things are in relation to each other. Curriculum designers, even in this model of the curriculum as causal, are not existing outside and above the society in which they operate. They are inherently part of that society. They're forming that society as they are formed by it. The curriculum is not independent of society and history, and thus treating the curriculum as something that can be constructed out of intentions, teaching methods, and outcomes, in short, like attempting a positivist approach to curriculum de development will be ineffective. Curriculum is not only contextual, it is, in fact, the context of learning. And so what does this really open up? What this opens up is, is a, a, an avenue towards the material. Considering the curriculum in this way allows us to consider the possibility of paying close attention to the context of teaching, not only as an influence on the curriculum, but as the curriculum itself. The practice of curriculum is not only what is taught and to whom, 
but also its location within an institution, a society and a history. And considering the curriculum as a contextual social process, or as, a, as I'm saying, a situated dialectical practice, opens this avenue of research towards the material. So curriculum research, as I'm conceptualizing it, is a thorough examination of the context in which education is taking place and the actual knowledge and learning that students experience and the values, ideology and narratives contained therein. So one of the things this opens up is this new understanding of the hidden curriculum. So non-Marxist understanding is that the hidden curriculum is this negative influence on the curriculum. Um, the curriculum is, con is constructed as always improving and always more suitable for the future. And the hidden curriculum is holding us in the past with these sort of bad structural forces, this sort of institutional forces holding everyone back. But no, that cannot be. All parts of the curriculum arise out of the same historical and material conditions. The institution and the people within that institution that produce the hidden curriculum and the curriculum on the paper on paper are the same people, um, or at least they have a high degree of overlap, especially considering that the curriculum is in part a curriculum in action. How can the in formal curriculum and the hidden curriculum be entirely opposite? Um, I, I think that what these theorists do is consider that anything negative or sort of behind the times is definitionally part of the hidden curriculum and everything positive is the formal curriculum. Um, and then it's only really when there's a contradiction between what is said in the formal curriculum, what is experienced in the hidden curriculum, um, that, the, that the difference is visible. Um, but the formal and hidden curriculum exist in relation to one another. The experiences of learning and what you are planned to learn is, is in relation. These things are, are must be considered relation. They cannot be considered as constitutive parts. Um, so the hidden curriculum is commonly portrayed as sort of intention with the formal curriculum, but I understand, I'm understanding this here to be dialectically related to the formal curriculum, and both must be considered together to be fulfilling the same purpose. So sort of in conclusion to all of that, learning to practice medicine cannot be separated from the broader societal context, including in whose interest medical practice operates. So we can't separate learning it from the, the societal context and therefore to examine the curriculum we have to look at that context it's always going to be insufficient to attempt to change medicine without considering what is constraining that change so let's have a little bit look at what is con those constraints how that is constrained so the first concept i want to bring in here is hegemony here so uh developed by antonio gramsci um Hegemony is a situation where the members of the dominate, dominated, dominated classes are ideologically blinded to their subordinate positions in the social structure. So the dominant classes use culture, education, art, religion to enact political domination through ideology. For example, many scholars have written about compulsory heterosexuality and heteronormativity. So that is that heterosexuality is the only acceptable sexual and romantic relationship. Uh, for example, Adrian Rich and have explored how this is maintained and upheld throughout the education system from primary school and indeed within medical education itself. Uh, Murphy in 2016 wrote on this. Hegemony is something, not something secondary, it's something really pervasive, which has saturated the consciousness of society. So the way we see the world, our common sense interpretations of it and what we consider to have all have arisen naturally a part of this organized dominant um, hegemonic culture. And that means that hegemony has, uh, 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 education has a, a hegemonic function. Why does a particular form of social knowledge exist and for whom and for whose benefit is it maintained? Why is reality constructed in partic particular ways and why are some of them so hard to alter? So Michael Apple sort of argues that this society, which is based on individual accumulation of capital, needs to seem as if it's the only possible world. But education is not a value neutral activity, although these values are rarely discussed and they're certainly not discussed in medicine. A system of formal education is the means by which people are prepared for life in society, not only to take part, but, but, but to perpetuate that society. And then academics and other intellectuals give legitimacy to the characters, the characters that structure our understanding of the world such that what is ide ideological appears natural and neutral. Thus, as the everyday activities of teachers and educators is to work as part of a system that reproduces that dominant capitalist culture and economy. So Michael Apple warns us, we cannot just challenge the practices of education. If hegemony existed only in those practices, 
then it would be possible to stop reproducing culture through better teacher training and better curricula. However, it's necessary to situate that challenge outside the institution. This is really in contrast to a liberal ideology of education, which holds that education creates and sustains social change. Education is seen as this natural, neutral and positive force capable of reversing inequalities and producing, promoting equality. If everyone was educated, this theory says, uh, then there'd be no more oppression. Um, and this ide ideology says that education can overcome any unfair distribution of wealth or opportunity. Obviously, we, we know that to be untrue and to be incorrect. Education can never be neutral. Um, through teaching, some traditions and modules are prioritized over others. Some forms of knowledge are given legitimacy and some behaviors are valued over others. However, there are always social interests embedded within the knowledge and a truly critical approach to education makes this the starting point. For example, Bourdieu looked at how well school students cope with middle-class culture, in inverted commas, something that might be analogous with a medical student being socialized into and becoming a full member of the medical community. Um, through this process of professional identity formation, some groups have advantages over others. Some people find it much easier to fit into medical culture than others do. So what this is leading me to is a class analysis of medical practice. If education can never be neutral and understanding the context of learning is vital to understanding what the curriculum is, then the next question has to be, what are we training medical students for? What is the function of medicine under capitalism? It cannot be a neutral benevolent activity as it's part of a formal system of education, at least in Britain, is largely managed and controlled by a capitalist state. Therefore, we must ask, what is the class position of doctors in Britain in 2022 or 2023 now, I guess? Um, this question is of great importance, I think, to any analysis of how to of learning to practice medicine. So very brief, very, very simplified <laughs> diagram about base and superstructure. So the base of society is the means of production, property and the class relations, and the superstructure is everything that's not to do with not to do with production. Um, and the base is generally dominant and, and the superstructure maintains and shapes the base is the kind of theory that I'm, I'm working with here. So my question is, is, where do doctors fit in? Where does medical practice sit here? So if the role of doctors is entirely superstructural, then it's analogous to the police, the lawyers, the investment bankers, the politicians. And under no, no, no matter under what conditions doctors practice, they can never be considered workers in the Marxist sense. However, if doctors are part of the base, then they too are severed and alienated from the products of their labor and their interests aligned with the interests of workers generally. So in this next section, I'm going to attempt to analyze the relation between medical practice as a particular form of social activity and the general relations of production that exist in Britain. So medical practice is of great use to capitalism. Aside from the large amounts of profit-making activities surrounding even a free at the point of delivery service, the private contracts for NHS services, the equipment, the pharmaceuticals, the laboratories, the intellectual property, the catering and the cleaning contracts, the buildings, the for-profit journals, the conferences, the insurance, and so on, medicine in England also delivers a workforce ready and capable to be productive for capitalists, ensuring the reproduction of the system. Medical professionals also have a large part to play in the determining of who is deserving of state benefits through, for example, the work capability assessment, and access to benefits is often contingent on either having worked, looking for work, or proving that you are unable to do so. Indeed, if someone is not able to work for longer than seven days and wishes to be excused from work, then the first person they must convince is the GP. Although it should be noted that capital has often been unhappy, unhappy with the willingness of GPs to sign people off work and would prefer access to independent expert advice on the functional capabilities of sick employees, uh, presumably so they can wring out the last bit of surplus value. Doctors in Britain have long enjoyed and indeed fought for a respected position as a profession. Doctor carries with it not only a sense of skill or expertise, many people are considered experts or skillful, for example, baristas, bricklayers, musicians, but a status. Doctors, the BMA had this interesting quote, which I found, which is that doctors should not be demoralized, burnt out, and face a future in health service that is overstretched and underfunded. I agree with that. I wonder that perhaps if their training, as uh, Gores argues in relation to scientists, entitles them to this interesting, well-paid and safe position. Perhaps going to medical school was in some way an insurance against being a worker. 
medicine is held to be a profession and it, it's one that comes with a degree of respect within society. And indeed, it goes even further than this because society actually denies the label of medical science to that knowledge that is not integrated into the role of the doctor and thus formally or informally taught through medical education. Medical science is dominated by bourgeois ideology, this positivism that's everywhere in science. The body is divided and subdivided into sections and specialisms and disease is a biological, not social function. Medical research tends to be directed towards the microscopic and away from the social knowledge that is equally relevant to health. Okay, let's get back to medical education. This has been far too long wandering in the weeds. So the whole process of medical education is designed so as to make medicine inaccessible to the vast majority, to alienate them from understanding their own condition and managing their own health. Holding medicine as a science is a way of ensuring its status in society. So when we're discussing this class character of medicine, let's consider a thought experiment. So imagine if the cleaner, the canteen server, the technician and the nurse were granted as much expertise and importance as the doctor in a hospital. Imagine if every research paper not only had the names of the doctors and scientists, but everyone who through application of knowledge and skill made that work possible. What effect would this have on the position of doctors? The hierarchy, I would argue, would definitely be disrupted. Hierarchy in production and society all, all over can be preserved only if expertise is made to preserve the privilege, the monopoly of those who are socially selected to hold both knowledge and authority. And this is what I argue is the case with, with GPs, uh, doctors. And in fact, as medical scientific knowledge expands, there's no such expansion in the ability of communities or even smaller units such as households to take healthcare into their own hands. If anything, the expansion of scientific knowledge has correlated with individuals being even less equipped to manage their own health, be it through an understanding of the body, freedom from poverty, access to cheap and nutritious food, leisure time, safe working and living environments, or adequate state welfare support. In trans healthcare, for example, some DIY sort of self-medding hormone use is actually criminalized. And I doubt, have doubt there are countless examples of communities. Um, I have no doubt that there are countless examples of communities having the knowledge they need but not being allowed to take their healthcare into their own hands. So it must be acknowledged that whatever the personal or political characteristics and identities of doctors, they are an embodiment of a system which removes the control of healthcare from the people themselves. And the drive for kind of patient and public involvement in healthcare arises from this contradiction. So it's a well-known contradiction. I'll briefly turn to the economic character of the practice of medicine. So I'm also going to consider the role of the British Medical Association, the trade union for doctors. The existence of this trade union suggests that doctors understand themselves to be workers, although perhaps not workers in the same way as other healthcare workers, as the BMA does not represent those. So prior to the founding of the National Health Service, the BMA had prepared a draft proposal for a state scheme, which they suggested that public medical service organised and administered by itself for the benefit of the lower levels of the working class, in this way, private practice would be preserved for all except those least able to pay. And the BMA really insists on private practice. So the negotiations between the BMA and the government in the 1940s is a history of competing class interests, and it's one that results in the compromise. Doctors would not be forced to work for the NHS, GPs would not be salaried, and consultants would retain their private practice, which could take place in the same premises as NHS practices, as well as GPs being compensated for no longer being able to sell a medical practice as an asset. And in fact, the BMA still in 2022, so last year, was still um, in echoing that this importance of private practice being allowed. Private practice, I would argue, is bourgeois, pretty bourgeois in character. The doctor either owns individually or jointly the means of production, the clinic or the consulting room and the equipment, which they then use to make profits for themselves rather than another company or a capitalist. This is complicated by obviously private healthcare clinics often renting space from landlords, but I would argue it doesn't change this principal contradiction at play, namely the provision of for-profit healthcare. And even outside their own practice, research by the Centre for Health and the Public Interest found hundreds of consultants directly employed by the NHS had equity stakes in private healthcare firms. There are obviously deep links between for-profit and NHS healthcare. In general practice, the situation is slightly different. If GPs are, not, GPs are not salaried, GP funding works a little differently. General practices are small business, businesses which are commissioned to provide services in a geographic area. Most healthcare takes place in this context. Most, health, most healthcare uh, takes place in the context of the, of the general practice, the GP clinic. 
GPs are very well paid. Their average income puts them in the top 3% of earners in England. And although their pay has fallen in real terms, along with many other sections of the workforce, um, salaried hospital doctors are also paid by the third year of trading uh, more than the national average. And consultants, excluding any private practice earnings, are also likely to earn in the top 3%. Commanding such an income, whether it's salaried or part as a partnership, gives doctors, uh, gives doctors access to the ruling classes through purchase of property, investments, and social contacts, as well as passing this benefit to any children they may have through access to private schooling and generational wealth. So everything I've said so far, doctors are bourgeois, right? Well, yeah, maybe not. Are they part of the section of the population who benefit from, benefit from rather than oppressed by the contradictions of capitalism? I think there are two things that complicate this analysis. Firstly, is that general practices are increasingly owned and operated by large for-profit companies. So an American private healthcare company, Centene, uh, owns and operates a large number of general practices across England. This is likely not the only such example. In addition, the number of GP partners has been steadily falling from around 21,000 in 2015 to 16,000 in 2020. And the number of salaried GPs grew over the same period, as did the number of GPs in training grades. So this reflects the proletarization of the workforce. Those salaried GPs are now likely to create surplus value for their employer, thus rendering them productive workers. The primary interest for that GP practice then becomes the maximization of that surplus value from their workers. The second complication is that as medical science becomes more technical, that is the increasing reliance on machines and technology, the doctors themselves give part of their expertise to the machine or the artificial intelligence algorithm. They can give their experience to a computer program which can never forget it, but at the same time as increasing a technological capability, they're effectively de-skilling themselves. This, of course, is of great advantage to capitalism, who is, which is most interested in the fungible worker who can be replaced easily and therefore is more precarious and likely to accept worse working conditions. There's already a workforce crisis in the NHS. One way of solving that crisis would be to capture that knowledge of doctors into an algorithm and render patient care a technological rather than personal activity. Needless to say, I think that would be disastrous for medicine and society as a whole. So in conclusion, I understand the class position of doctors as one that's vulnerable to proletarization. Although it's in its current form, medical knowledge plays a superstructural role in upholding capitalist ideology. In describing it thus, I'm not implying that medicine is entirely controlled by the bourgeoisie, but that the nature of medicine is determined by the class struggle. So for example, the creation of the NHS did not lead to the overthrow of capitalism in Britain. Okay, where are we going in this sprawling analysis? Well, uh, good question, thank you for asking. How can this be applied to disability studies? So the failure of medical science to properly account for the experience of disabled people is a feature, not a bug. Capitalism hinges on the ability of capitalists to sever people from their means of production and to force them to sell their labor power in exchange for a wage. The desire for maximum surplus value leads to a desire for the most productive, most predictable, cheapest laborers. Unemployment, in addition, is a necessary part of the capitalist economy. Full employment would intolerably strengthen the position of worker in relation to the employer. This has extremely harmful and oppressive effects for those people whose bodies or behaviors render them less productive than the prevailing rate. From the outset of capital relations, social evaluation of individual labor power meant that slower, weaker, or more inflexible workers were devalued in terms of their potential for, pay, for paid work. In this framework, I'm kind of drawing a distinction between impairment and disability. Impairment refers to a, a part of our mechanism, effective part of mechanism in the body or the absence of a body part. And disability in this framework is a socially created category derived from labor relations. So I'm drawing on the work of Martha Russell here. And it's one that is necessary to allow the economic conditions for a few to accumulate vast wealth. No assumption can be made about the social meaning or significance of impairment. It can only be understood historically and culturally. So for example, in Britain, a person with slightly or moderately impaired sight is not constructed with disabled. The ubiquity of glasses, a good ubiquity of aids such as glasses and contact lenses and allowances, glasses or contact lenses are welcome in the vast majority of circumstances, means that such people do not have an oppressive social experience made their, their, their impairment. They are, in other words, not disabled. We can contrast this with the experience of a wheelchair user who will be excluded on the basis of design for ac accessing many buildings, who will not be able to take public transport, who have a much more limited choice when it comes to housing, who may need a variety of expensive and unusual aids in their home, and who is, in other words, disabled. 
This is not to ignore the limits that impairment place upon individually, individuals, rather that materialists seek to separate both ontologically and politically the oppressive social experience of disability from the unique functional limitations and cap capability and capacities which impairment can pose for individuals, from Gleason. So what does this mean? This means that medical science is currently constrained from fully realizing the humanity of disabled people. This is why the struggles over the curriculum are always going to be incomplete and insufficient, because medical practice has a superstructural role in upholding capitalism. And any adding any element of socialism and medicine will always be in conflict with the dominant capital, capitalist ideology. Medicine is in capitalist countries is part of capitalism. Medical practice does not want medical knowledge to be generally available. It wants it to be the purview of the exalted few. To provide genuine, collaborative, person-centered care to disabled people, medicine must not, must not only be reformed, but must be transformed. So let's look at an example from some of my documentary analysis. So medical practice, the early findings that I'm seeing from this documentary work is that although the social determinants of health framework has this potential to extend this inquiry towards political economy, it tends to stop short of this. It understands this determinants as these sort of disarticulated risk factors. One doesn't relate to the other, they're just risk factors. And what this leads to is a tendency towards an understanding of health inequality as being largely or wholly a matter of individual behavior. Where structural forces are mentioned, these are often presented completely abstractly and without any kind of cause. An example. So this is from this textbook. So this is a textbook for clinical students, postgraduate trainees, primary care educator, educators. This textbook is produced by the Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, it's, for, it's about learning general practice. And it contains this lovely diagram. What this diagram is showing is the determinants of health. Um, the biggest section in the determinants, according to this textbook, is individual behavior, 38%, which is a very specific number. I have no idea how they arrived at 38%. So of course, if this is the training that a GP receives, of course they go on to recommend behavior change as a primary mechanism of health promotion. It is, as discussed earlier, in their interest to do so. So in conclusion, the medical science that contributes to the ongoing oppression of disabled people also oppresses the doctors themselves through this work. I hope to be able to demonstrate this as we look at the kind of increasing prioritization of the workforce. What that means is that doctors must become allies of the working class as a whole and not work against them. And medical science must also become a tool of political education. Medicine can only truly stop being part of bourgeois culture when it's put entirely to the service of the people. It must be transformed to the collaboration and cooperation between doctors and patients with the sharing and dissemination of knowledge being the first concern. This process would, however, be entirely antithetical to the values of a capitalist society, which seeks to contain knowledge and to ration and withhold access to healthcare. And therefore, this must come with a socialist revolution. The end. Thank you very much. Well, that was, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Leonard. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm sure people have so many questions. So, um, yeah. So if you if you would like to raise your hand, uh, if you have a question, or write it into the chat box, or, uh, yeah, we can, uh, you can write, uh, or you can write stuck in in the chat box or or your own question, and, um, yeah, I will, uh, we will take one um, at a time, um. Oh, Luke, yes, please. Hi, uh, thanks, Leonard. Really enjoyed the talk. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, I'm afraid they're a little bit methodological, which I know is pretty dry to be kicking off the evening with. <laughs> sure, go for it. Out. So the first one is on the traditional way of understanding the relationship between the curriculum, the profession as a whole, and the, the hidden curriculum. And you contrast that with your own uh, dialectical and materialist method. It, it seemed to me that the original way of looking at it, the, the one that you oppose, seems kind of perfectly 
dialectical and at least with with minor modifications perfectly compatible with with a materialist analysis i.e we have this uh, this institution you know effectively institution a curriculum and a, and a practice of training um combined with the profession as a whole and then civil society right and developments in one or the other lead to contradictions with the, the curriculum um and then we adjust the curriculum is practice and the curriculum is written document accordingly. And if you like Claire Hilton include class struggle within the, the hidden curriculum, um, then then ultimately you, you you end up with something that looks dialectically materialist. So I, I wondered if you could maybe go into a bit more detail about how you would counterpose your method or whether you believe there's a, a critique of the, the kind of dialect, dialectical logic, which is implicit in that. The second one is on your, your base superstructure distinction. Um, you use a very broad definition of superstructure, um, which there's a lot of debate about within the Marxist canon at, at the moment. But from the, the kind of cash out examples you used, it seemed that that wasn't entirely necessary for your, um, the actual, the cash value, the conclusions that you want to make. Um, medicine doesn't simply need to be an ideological bolster to capital, um, nor does it need to be simply um, a a way of disciplining certain professions. It sounds like it can, through the reproduction of labor power and through the generation of profit, be equally well fitted into, into kind of cuts, certain understandings of the base relationship. I, I wondered whether you you felt that the base superstructure distinction in the way that you present it is really essential to the argument and whether I'm missing something or whether it's it's largely a kind of incidental and, and um, elucidatory point. Cheers. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so to take the first one, I think, yeah, I think you're right, like you've raised, like the, the issue around the, the, the dialectical, potential dialectical nature of how, how the curriculum is currently uh, thought of. Um, however, that's not really something that I see in the medical literature. Um, so what I generally see in the literature is the understanding, is, is this understanding of the curriculum as a document, it's understood doc, as a doc, in doc, documentary form. Now, it might be that that document then is reacting to uh, changes in um, you know, society and then the document gets updated and you could argue that is dialectical. But what I am, what sort of my argument is, is that actually yeah, that's always, that's ne it's never going to fully react because it's not considered a practice. So unless you consider the curriculum as a practice, the curriculum is actually never going to be able to be updated in the way that you would need to in order to change it, because that, what you actually need to do is change the social relation. So um, the argument that that's kind of the argument that I'm making, which is not to say that the current process cannot also be construed dialectically, but that specifically in the medical literature, the thing that is missing is this understanding of the curriculum as a practice. Um, the second point, no, the base superstructure is not entirely, in, it was just elucidatory, it's not, it's not a co core point. Um, I may develop it further, I may not uh, have it in at all. Yeah, that, that was two two great answers um it, yeah so i'll just check if other people um okay yes yeah there are some um questions in in the chat um yeah should i just i just take the so daniel's one so um amazing, yeah. yeah so really interesting point i mean the um I did actually uh, a review of the decolonizing the medical curriculum literature, um, and it, uh, it it lacks a theory basically. So um, in general, it um, what it ends up doing, and I'm kind of drawing from my memory here a little bit, so I may get some things a little wrong. Which is, but what it tends to end up doing is presenting um, all different forms of knowledge as equally valid and therefore doesn't ever look at why some forms of knowledge are perpetuated over others um so i think again there could really be potential for exploring that i definitely think the critical disability studies and marxist disability theory could be used to depathologize aspects of the curriculum i don't see it currently in the decolonizing the medical curriculum literature certainly not the stuff that i read uh the a couple of years ago um but um um but yeah, I'm not. Uh, I it's. Uh, I think. I think that there are that, that there are interesting avenues to be explored using critical disability studies and Marxist disability theory. Um, I've been kind of formulating in my thesis. I formulate kind of um, the decolonizing the medical curriculum as sort of like a bourgeois attempt at decolonization. That is, it's it's sort of changed to stay the same. It's 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 gesturing towards something without really looking at the at the core of it. That's how I read the the, the literature currently. Which is not to say that there is not potential 
in that framework. It's just not something that I see in the literature. Yeah, thanks. That was great. Um, so looking in the chat, there is yeah, Mel, who is asking. Uh, oh, yeah, I sure. Mm -hmm. um, this is not something that I have a huge amount of knowledge about, but I would imagine that, yeah, absolutely, the way that medical approaches, they would definitely play this role, exactly what those roles are, I wouldn't be able to say, but I would think almost certainly um, that, yeah, that, that, that there would be. And I think there's a question from, from Rich. Uh, yeah, um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, hi, um, just from my um, reading of the early um, writers in disability studies, and I'm thinking people like Vic Finkelstein, Michael Oliver, and people like that. Um, disability studies was, uh, and the social model of disability was put forward as a, as a challenge to the dominance of, of, of medical understandings of um, disability and it very covers an impairment um, and so that so do you think that that is still entrenched or do you think uh, because I, I think uh, disability studies has uh, gone some way in challenging the dominance of medical approaches I, I wouldn't argue it's over the, overthrow uh, the position of the um, uh, medical uh, education as well but I just wondered what your thoughts were and the second point would be um, someone who's involved in um, uh, advocacy uh, and um, involvement groups within the NHS uh, recently today I was reading documents and I came across the phrases uh, such as self-management of health conditions and social prescribing and the idea of active citizenship. And I wondered what your views were on those um, ideas and approaches. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer your first question, yeah, I think that the social model has obviously done like in the work of um, disability activists has done fantastic work in, in kind of um, in kind of addressing this sort of hegemony of this position of the medical position. I think it uh, certainly in society, I think there's been like, I mean, just my view is just that there's been this has been an amazing work, like really fantastic advocacy. And we, you know, I wouldn't be anywhere near my PhD without the work of all those activists um, and, the, and the theorists. I don't think it's necessarily reached a huge amount of challenge in, in medicine. Um, I, I think that there probably are some doctors who understand it like that, that understand the social model. There are definitely doctors who try to apply it in their practice. Um, whether that is, I don't think it has, it's not pervasive. Um, I still think there's a lot of medicalization and pathologization of disability within medicine and within the culture of medicine is, is my experience. Um, so yeah, although I, I'm sure that that, I'm sure that that challenge exists. It just, it, it you know, it still is, um, it's struggling against uh, not only the sort of medical model, but it's also struggling against the the requirement of disability to be upheld as a category um, for the purposes of, of capital accumulation. So yeah, I think it's done really great work, but um, yeah, I think, yeah. And the second point I have forgotten, um, could you remind me? Uh, oh, I've, say, um, carry on. Just to say, um, in reading NHS documents today, I've come across uh, phrases such as social prescribing and self-management mm -hmm. and the idea of active citizenship. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was kind of uh, a recurrent free theme throughout the document. Mm -hmm. and I just wondered what if you had any views on uh, phrases such as those. Yeah, I mean, I, self-management, obviously, I would, I think, I th the thing is, I think both of those things, well, social prescribing is a little more complicated because yeah, that's a bit of a different issue. But the term of self-management, I think it could be really good, right? If it also yeah. came with like a, a genuine collaboration with, you know, doctors and patients, like genuinely collaborating together. What do people need? How do they need to, what do they need to manage their own conditions? What support do they need? If it was like a genuinely collaborative experience, I think that what I would hope for is that people were able to sort of self-manage. 
I don't think that's how the NHS is currently using that term. I think it's more about kind of putting putting the onus onto onto um, you know sort of disabled people or sick people and, and otherwise sick people to, to manage their own conditions. So I I don't know that it's being used in that way. But if it is, then that would to me that sounds really good. The issue of social prescribing um, um, is complicated. I don't do a huge amount of my work on social prescribing or my research on social prescribing. Um, I don't particularly enjoy it as a kind of framework. I think that it's again sort of like looking to sort of push the onus back onto people's individual behaviors, which is I, in some ways all that that sort of uh, general practitioners certainly are kind of con certainly sometimes constrained in doing so. Um, and I'm sure it's a very frustrating experience for them as well, which is de definitely one of the things that I kind of want to, um, you know, want to kind of bring forward in my analysis that this is not just an experience that like, that is, that is upsetting and unpleasant for patients. It's also bound to be an experience that's kind of like upsetting and unpleasant for doctors as well. Um, um, and just to echo what, what Mel has said, like, it's very neoliberal in its in its construction, like it, you know, about putting this kind of um, it's definitely putting it back onto this kind of um, you know, individual management. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why I'd say about that. I'd I'd kind of read those terms, I would read them sort of quite skeptically for me. Um, but yeah, that it depends exactly how they're enacted. Thank you. Well, that was really great. So we have many questions, which is exciting. Uh, yes, thanks so much, uh, Leonard, for, for the great answer. So we have, I think the order is Nicola, then we have iPhone, sorry, I don't know your name, and then Cavana, then we have, um, I think, Catherine and uh, Mel and Nate, I can't, I can't remember the order. Um, and then Joanna, so yeah, maybe if you want to start with Nicola and I try to, to write the order. Sure. Uh, yeah, Nicola, please go ahead. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, I'm terribly sorry I was late. I got all muddled with the time. I'm very sorry I missed it, but I can go back and review it. So really, really appreciate, um, appreciate it. Um, I, I just want to go at it. Um, I'm a, a auto ethnographer type artist practice space so I'm going to go at it in my language um so I just want to I, your talks made me recall that as a child my mother had very serious severe anxiety that was treated we're talking about the 60s and 70s um treated with only offered um uh, tranquilizers and so um and of course, the role of the the role of the NHS in underpinning um, social reproduction, the reproduction of the workforce, um, you know, and my mother was not offered options for a different kind of life where she would be happier. She was given tranquilizers so she could carry on cooking our dinners, changing our beds, cleaning our toilets and uh, dealing with you know her ex existential nightmare um and i'm now um looking at family trauma transgenerational trauma as a widespread social experience and which is highly denied uh and seen as um you know, only applicable, you know, for transgenerational trauma as being something that happens in extreme cases to a few people in a kind of individualized story. Whereas um, I'm exploring this uh, through my creative practice and literary criticism as something that is there in our culture all the time to be seen by those who, who will see it. Um, and I wonder if that, that so, that's my second sort of point question is, you know, what are your thoughts about trauma um, as the sort of great an elephant in the room in terms of um, the mind and body, uh, you know? Um, and then finally, I was recent, this kind of goes on to what about the practice, the, the medical practitioners who really are, who really are quite good. Okay. So, um, 
going on to recently um, that I'm the oldest person I know to have been diagnosed with ADHD at 62 um, and dyspraxia. And um, when the psychiatrist came on the video to talk to me, um, he told me a truth that I didn't even know, which is um, ADHD is trauma based. Um, you've been, have you been to therapists and counsellors? Yes. I bet you've been told, you know, you need to change, uh, there's something wrong with you, we can't, you know, whatever we do, you're not happy, what's, you know, wh what on earth are we going to do with you? Something wrong with you that you can't respond to treatment. And I said, yes, absolutely, exactly. Um, and I just felt like, just to conclude in that, you know, um, there are fantastic practitioners who are mortified at the cloth ears, um, of course, of, of um, clinical managers and, and what have you, and, and the, whole, the whole system's ideological underpinning. Um, and they do offer us quite a lot of mm, foundation stones for the future as well. But I feel that my contribution as, you know, like all of us as a disabled person with a story, with experience, can feed into that. And so I just wondered what you think. Sorry, go on too long. Sorry. No, no, no. That's yeah. I think I don't know a huge amount about trauma, but I think you're from what you say, it seems incredibly relevant to like this kind of experience. So and what and the sort of things I'm talking about. And I think I'm yeah, really. Um, yeah, I think that's. I think what you're saying is 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 very true. There must be these kind of gen generational uh, traumas, especially from the kind of experiences that that you're talking about with um, your mother, and also the 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 comment that Lisa's made in the chat. So yeah, I think it sounds really really relevant. Um, Thank you. Um, in terms of the good practitioners, yeah, one of the things that I'm I didn't get to in this talk, but I I will I do get to in my PhD is the ways in which practitioners are themselves constrained by the nature of practice. So one of the things that happens a lot is that practitioners are told things like, you must look after your own mental health, you must look after yourself. And they are entirely constrained from doing so because they are also told you have to have X number of patients a day. You have to make this much money for the practice. You have to have this number of appointments. You have to offer phone consultations. You have to do X, Y, Z. Under those conditions, practitioners are not able to look after themselves. They are not able, they're completely constrained by the conditions of practice um, from doing so. So yeah, there are fantastic practitioners. There are, there are really wonderful doctors out there um, who are often constrained by, um, by situations of their own practice. There are also, even in the wonderful doctors, sometimes the way that they have been taught this kind of, certainly this sort of um, push towards um, sort of this sort of mechanical materialism, this positivist approach to science um, yes. really does also produce problems, right? It just produced sort of, understandings of the body that are ultimately unhelpful. The example I always think of, which I think is given by Vincenzo Navarro, is that, you know, um, doctors will always understand tuberculosis as being caused by a bacteria and not by poverty. Um, you know, they will never understand that poverty causes tuberculosis. Um, and they won't even, under, even if they kind of understand it as like a second hand, uh, oh yes, also this occurs more in, 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 in conditions of poverty, it's not, it will never be thought of in a medical textbook as like a primary driver. So this is the example I, I, I find really illuminating from, 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 from Vincente Navarro. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that there, there are really great practitioners and I, and I hope to kind of through my work, like really highlight how they are also constrained from doing this yes. job and what is really needed is this like genuine collaboration. Um, yeah, Thank it's, you I hope so that much. answers your question. It's fantastic. I think yes, Saul, Saul is next. Yes. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Leonard. And I, this may have been covered a little bit. My internet was a bit jumpy early on, so forgive me if uh, this has come up. But I just wanted to preamble with uh, uh, maybe something the previous speaker might already know about. But in terms of texts or stories that are connected with um, issues, themes of mothers and children, uh, dealing with bodily trauma and body minds, um, I would highly recommend to you and to everybody, 
Alice Hattrick's Ill Feelings, which is a wonderful part memoir, part polemic about the suspicion of non-normative, uh, non-male bodies by the medical profession. So I'd, I'd really recommend uh, that text. Um, Leonard, yes, um, you, again, my internet might have jumped, you may have covered this, but um, you mentioned early at the, at the beginning of your presentation, the status of doctors as gatekeepers, um, that they occupy this position um, as validating somebody's employ a, a disabled person's employment status. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could expand a bit on where you, you covered really generously how, like, how that happens or why that happens, but where, where that's come from, like, what are the circumstances of, is, is it like modernity that brings that about? Is it, was it always thus? Like at what point did that kind of, did that position get solidified like that? Um, I actually do not know the answer to that question. I would, I would <laughs> be very happy to kind of look that up and, and, and find out for you, but I actually don't know. Yes, please. <laughs> I, I, th I think it's a fairly, I know, I know exactly who to ask on that. So I can definitely find out. Oh, wow. Oh, um, uh, yeah, there's definitely been, um, sort of involvement with doctors in um um yeah in the, in in the kind of validating of 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 what is considered the kind of the relationship with health and work is also something that i explore very heavily and sort of sort of doctors being involved in the sort of position of saying whether someone is is um is able to work or not able to work and there's actually been a lot of sort of tension between um certainly general practitioners and the state on this issue uh, general practitioners in some research uh, was fact were found to be to really not want people to work where they didn't work want to work if they were unable to work um G gps were very likely to say you can't work um please take time off um and uh capitalists very broadly were unhappy with that situation and wanted an independent review of their their work capability so that's kind of how we arrive at the current situation where the, the actual the doctor's involvement in the work capability assessment is now reduced, I believe, from where it was. So I, I will find this answer for you. Um, I will look find for you the history of doctors' involvement in the certifying of disability um, for the purpose of state benefits, and I will send it to you. If you could, I think you must have my email from. Um, I don't know if you have my email, but um, uh, uh, it. I can if you maybe perhaps by a. I've um, just put, a, I've just whacked it my one in the chat. If that's useful, let's um, have a look. Let's. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, thank got you. It. Yeah, yeah, got it. Got slide it, got it. into yeah. my DMs when you want. I thank will you so slide much, into your DMs with the information. Yeah, no problem at all. I'll do my best <laughs> to get you an answer. Great. Yeah, uh, I think um, yeah. Kavana was next. Hi. Yes. Uh, I guess my question was about the issue of uh, in individuated responsibility for healthcare. And if there is some kind of contradiction between doctors being primed to say that uh, you're responsible for your own health at the same time, not giving you the uh, capacity to look after your own health in any way, is, is, is there a contradiction in those terms or is that like? <laughs> no, very much so. Yeah, I think you've absolutely highlighted the, the, the really key point, which is that, yeah, there is a because of this influence of sort of individual, this, this focus on on individual behavior habits, um, but actually not really often given giving the the um, the tools. And I think, you know, as I think Ellen was mentioning, the kind of like social prescribing model is slightly, slightly kind of geared towards this, but um, uh, in uh, there haven't actually been any, um, there have been no studies of social prescribing that have showed an effect that, that it has that effect, um, which is not to say that people don't enjoy it, like it, people didn't want it and all that kind of stuff. But, um, there hasn't been a kind of study that shows that like it has the sort of effect in in reducing um the, the these kind of um health inequalities or these health burdens so yeah i think that there definitely is a contradiction there being like you know go ahead and, and look after yourself but give you no tools to do so um uh, and and partly because they can't right like i also one of the things i kind of also want to want to bring out in my PhD is, is this way in which their practice is constrained. Like doctors are not responsible for the entirety of health inequalities. Although as I demonstrate their class position does, you know, the, the nature of their work is determined by the class struggle and their class position is perhaps one that is of a sort of higher class status. That doesn't mean that they are entirely personally responsible for, um, for, these, for these inequalities that they are then told that they have to man manage through their practice. So I think they're actually in a very difficult position sort of um, in, in some ways. Um, and, and yeah, and I think the kind of perhaps leaning toward the individual 
personally, I would like to see all sort of like 46,000 GPs in the country become revolutionaries. I think that would be great. Um, <laughs> although like, that is potentially unlikely, but what I would really like to see is like, all the doctors be like, "Hey, wait! What are we actually doing? Like, there are forty six thousand of us. Let's um, let Look. let's 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 reassess where we're kind of putting our energy." Um, but I don't think that's likely to happen. Uh, well, I hope it happens, but you know, not 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 tomorrow anyway. But yeah, yeah. I think you've highlighted a really key contra contradiction. Thank you. No, I, I actually just remembered that uh, there, was, there were recent reports of doctors uh, refusing to treat disabled patients, and I guess this is how they. Uh, resolve the contradiction it's yes. like if you can't be responsible for your health I won't treat you yes that's exactly how the contradiction gets resolved and and, and, that, and that's the case um for example if when you come to um things like the treatment of of fat people by doctors like it's the same issue doctors believe that or are taught repeatedly that um that that fat is bad for you which is there is very little evidence for um right. and um and then resolve the the problem by saying well unless you can become magically thin i will not investigate your condition um right. so yeah it's the same kind of it's exactly how it gets resolved in, in many examples great thanks so much thanks for the presentation thank you um i think uh catherine's question Catherine, was it yes. yes it was in oh yeah it was in the um chat uh do you think that current conceptualizations of pages sent and care you know, uphold the idea yes so definitely definitely so um the kind of yeah the the, the patient centered care the way that it's enacted currently is very much to put individual responsibility onto the patient um uh it it i i i really would like to see i think the future of medicine if i you know the socialist future of medicine i would want to see would be a kind of genuine collaborative collaboration uh between doctors and patients um you know, sharing knowledge, sharing experience, uh, both types of knowledge, lived experience and medical knowledge having the same weight, medical knowledge not being sort of based in, based, considered to be sort of positivism in science, but being considered a, a you know, a sort of um, dialectical practice. Um, but yeah, I think um, currently, yes, I think this is exactly how it works. I, I, I fully agree. Uh, um, Nate, sorry, it's been so long. I'm so sorry, Nate. No worries. Can you hear me? Yep. I enjoyed the paper. Thank you very much. I I had a question, um, and this is rooted partly in ignorance because I live in the United States. So two part question. Um, I I'm thinking about the United States, where as far as I know, doctors end up being managed by people, at least in part, who have some medical training, not exclusively, but so that. And I think about my own workplace by analogy as well, like my boss and my boss's boss received academic training. And so in a sense, the curriculum that they came up through is something that is part of how I do my job and is also part of how they supervise and manage me. And I don't know if the NHS has a similar structure, whether it's a kind of career advancement ladder of managerial doctors or not. But mm -hmm. um, I, I was just curious if that has any bearing or not on the curriculum. Like, is the curriculum something that produces physician manageability? Is the curriculum a site that's where there's efforts to build in, hey, let's make the curriculum useful for management in the future? And if, if it, you know, if the answer is no, that's fair enough. It's question rooted in ignorance. But I will say, you know, if nothing else, um, it's a really good talk and it made me curious about that stuff, which I hadn't thought about before. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, broadly, yes, but there's one specific thing that I kind of want to bring in and, uh, about on this point, which is that one of the ways that the kind of curriculum gets enacted is at the bedside. And so what that means is that the doctor, there's a more senior doctor who is teaching a group of junior doctors at the bedside. Sometimes they are medical students, sometimes they're junior doctors. Um, it depends. Um, and that there's been a huge amount of research on the utter horror of what it is like to learn at the bedside. And like the, there's been huge amounts of research on the complete horror that it is to be to become a professional the process of professional identity formation as a doctor is as far as i can tell from the literature completely traumatic um it is a process of just being you know harmed on a daily basis um and so one of the ways this you know this intense hierarchy in medicine is one of the ways in which you know medical culture sort of perpetuates itself so the way that junior doctors are taught is as you in the kind of analogy that you've drawn with your workplace right like the way that junior doctors are taught is also the way that the senior doctors were taught is the way that the senior doctors above them were taught it's all related and there is you know there's these kind of there's papers by a academic called uh, lynn monroe who's just great on this kind of stuff and she sort of 
talks about there's just the kind of ways that, that that junior doctors and medical students are just told to just you know put all the kind of horrors of their experiences behind them just get on with it and how they have to just ignore the fact that they were you know being yelled at by some doctor uh, you know uh, on rounds or whatever and um and the other thing that happens a lot is this kind of intense tension the medical students feel which is that they'll go to a uh you know they'll be in some teaching scenario and um they will see something that is really wrong you know they'll see something that is racist or sexist or ableist or, or just just horrible that is being done and they will be unable unable to comment on it because of that hierarchy and so this creates this horrible experience of tension, toughen up and take it exactly, like as, as Nicholas says in the chat, like that's what they're told. Um, and so what this means is creates this horrible tension. The way that that tension gets resolved is by, by becoming part of that profession in some way, by learning to live with that profession and then potentially eventually to perpetuate it. So yeah, it's, uh, it, it, I, it is, um, it definitely, <laughs> kicking things it is very like very very relevant um this experience of like the doctor having the experience of them teaching the, 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 the junior doctor there's not quite the same system of management that's like being that you're talking about the management structure is in the nhs is um is just wildly complicated um there but there is also that same management there will be a sort of a consultant that might have a team there will be a ward or something that is managed there'll be a group of doctors working together on something with some being senior and some being less senior so the same issues that you describe um in america will also per perpetuate here thank you if i may very, just very quickly that's fascinating and appalling and very thought-provoking um just because you said it's early work and you wanted feedback maybe you're already covering all that but if you're not i would suggest including all of that in saying hey my framework sheds light on this thing other scholars has done is itself a really valuable contribution that's really compelling stuff and saying you know other people have said this but not in a marxist framework and i think <clears> is itself would be a huge contribution of your work and final thing and then i'll shut up i've, I've been reading simon clark's book uh, marx marginalism and modern sociology and he has this amazing <clears> bit about classical political economy where he says classical political classical political economy achieves some breakthroughs in understanding the economy i'm paraphrasing and then it gets stupider and actually the loss of scientific explanatory power is an ideological strength and so that i can and i can imagine I, i'm thinking about that in some other stuff i do on in my own work but i can imagine that in a way tracking onto some of what you're talking about it the curriculum not having space and and failure to understand some of these things actually gives it ideological power that makes it actively selected for so the fact that the curriculum can't account for its own brutality is it sounds like a bug to me as a human being it sounds awful but it may actually be a structural feature for the institution i think so yeah anyway, thank you so much thank I you agree. such great work i'm really really enjoyed hearing thank you really appreciate it yeah thanks for the great um answers um yeah it's uh Joanna. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So this is the question about how, if I could talk a bit about the future interviews with GPs and how I'll pitch my research. So um, yeah, it's going to be a difficult one. I think the the kind of the the structure, this um, interview schedule I'm developing is I'm really asking them about their practice. I'm asking them about their experience of practice. So I'm not kind of I'm not telling them necessarily that I'm I'm not you know being like this is my class analysis of GPs because I, I said I sense that would uh, get me off onto a bad foot. Um, but I, um, I am asking them, what I'm asking them about is their experience of their practice. Like, how do they, you know, what do they, um, you know, what sort of things about, like, how do they feel about the community that they're in? You know, how do they arrive at the community that they're in? Um, what is their relationship to the people? How, how do they understand the area that they work in? Um, you know, things like that. And then asking them about, like, when they first heard about health inequality and medical school, where did they hear about it? Was it in every class? Was it in just some classes? Was it a single lecture? Was it um, a course um, in their training? Like, do they feel that there is any kind of mismatch between the way they're taught about it and their ability to practice on it? Um, so yeah, I'm kind of asking these questions that are really related to their to their practice, to their professional practice. Um, I'm I'm definitely I definitely don't want to kind of like I definitely don't want to sort of attack individual doctors. I hope that I avoid that um, uh, even as as I kind of analyze the, the class practice, I don't necessarily, I, you know, I, the classes are obviously, it's in the name, it's a, it's a, it's a unifying structure rather than like an individual attribute. So, um, so yeah, I definitely don't want to kind of like 
go into the doctors too hard. And I think I, I will definitely take a couple of pilot interviews to get that correct. Um, but I'm hoping that kind of by asking these questions about their experience, their, their, their work, how they relate to their profession, how they relate to their community, I'll kind of get the answers that I actually am looking for. That was amazing. Uh, there, there are many great comments in the chat. Um, I hope we can save it and and upload it. Um, so let me see. I don't know if I'm missing questions. Um, I don't think there are any other questions. No. Okay. I think we're good. Oh, there's a question. Paul has a hand up. But apart from that. Oh, great, Paul. Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Uh, I think a Marxist account has to recognize the relationship directly between uh, medicine and labor and the production of value and the way in which bodies are directly connected to productivism and the productive process. And here I'm thinking of very sophisticated versions of that around Marxism in the body by people like David McNally uh, and Joseph Rashia, who, and so are Mao's recent piece in the New Sage Handbook, which might be worth looking at. They are focused on the body, but they have direct applications to disability. I don't think that means you fall into a base superstructure trap, but if you do, you should have a look at Raymond Williams' Culture and Materialism's selection of essays, which I think is extremely important in, man, in, in, in taking Gramscian ideas and directly applying them to political economy in a way which is very uh, constructive. The other is to recognise that as well as about labour, it's about ownership. And the problem with the medical establishment is that it owns knowledge. And uh, Ivan Illich and David McKnight put together, uh, and I've got it somewhere on PDF so I can send it to you, are a lovely set of collection of essays in which McKnight talks about directly about the way the medical establishment self-reinforces because it has a curative philosophy. So doctors, before they even begin to think about their knowledge, first of all, want to defend it in a, in a somewhat Foucauldian, but we will want to translate into a Marxist sense of ownership. But also, their very raison d'etre is curative. It's maintenance. It's notions of normality and getting people to a normal health. And that, of course, needs to be disrupted so that we don't have a normal health, that we recognise a difference, and we recognise disability, and we recognise, for example, a preventative notion, which actually talks about the health of people in terms of disrupting the working day, in terms of easing exploitation. And those sorts of uh, sources and ways of thinking might deepen the way in which you're attacking medicine. Because ultimately, in looking at doctors we have a great deal of sympathy but their structural as somebody said earlier their structural position and the structural position of medical knowledge and epistemology puts them in a position where they can but maintain the very thing yeah. we're talking about yeah um thank you so much that's so helpful um uh, that's yeah just thank you so much I think looking at the body is is definitely something that I want to do whether I will have space in my 80,000 words is, is a question but I want to I want to try and get it in there I think that's really really important um I've read a bit of Raymond Williams and I think I should return because I think you're right I don't I, I want to make sure that I'm getting this like base superstructure argument right um and I think yeah thank you so much for reminding me that that's the place to go um and yeah they they can but maintain this is this is there the, yeah there is no other possibility um under these current uh, conditions um which is yeah very much the argument which i i hope is not too kind of um prosaic i hope there is something new in there that i could bring certainly bringing marxism to medical education is is itself new so i hope that that's kind of like what i can aim to do yeah, yeah thank you so much that's so helpful yeah thanks leonard and yeah mel has her hands up uh, it's not a question for you, it's just to inform everybody that if you want to look into what informed policies and work capability assessments and um, everything like that, it's the biopsychosocial model 
It's the one developed by Waddell and Aylwood, not Engels. The original one by Engels was quite helpful, but Waddell and Aylwood were doctors. They developed this social model, this biopsychosocial model for the government, for the DWP, and said that uh, it was more psychological, focusing on psychological factors. So that might be something useful for the future to look into. Yeah, thank you so much. That's, yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that. Yes, if people, more people have a question. Um, yeah, um, maybe just, I will just ask uh, a very, very tiny question. Thank you so much, first of all, for this amazing talk and, and all the great answers. Um, I was wondering, um, uh, so, so you have developed this very sophisticated and, and very subtle critique um, of the curriculum and medical education from a materialist and Marxist perspective, and my and I was wondering whether um, and 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 the, there were many um, great insights, but just thinking of how you were talking about um, the role of medical practice in um, upholding capitalism, I was wondering whether um, whether the the doc the junior doctors maybe also or senior doctors to whom you've been speaking whether they have um whether they are um they, whether they are comfortable acknowledging this and and engaging in a self um in a criticism of their role um in this and whether um so this would be um yeah something i was wondering about and also whether there is whether you think that uh, this, uh, the way in which medical practice upholds capitalism, whether um, through us, um, whether whether at the superstructural level, whether you think that it uh, reproduces class antagonisms between um, uh, doctors and patients, uh, and whether that um so first whether you think that actually there is this reproduction of class antagonisms through the exercise of control um uh, and also whether um uh, there is yeah yeah whether you feel you think that there is this reproduction and whether doctors are willing to um acknowledge and, and discuss and 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 um yeah self critically mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I can't obviously not be able to speak for doctors. Um, the ones that I have spoken to generally do not acknowledge or wish to discuss that position. Um, uh, just from my experience, not to speak, I'm sure that there are doctors they would. I'm sure there are Marxist doctors out there. Um, but the ones I've spoken to uh, when I was applying for my PhD, I got several comments that were things like, why do you hate doctors? Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I was like I don't <laughs> where did I say that um and you know sort of things like you know you know why are you attacking medicine when it's done so much good and I was like well because firstly it hasn't secondly it could do better um you know so uh generally that generally there is a kind of I would say uh some yeah yeah I, I don't think that my research is well received um generally um so I think actually, and part of that, what such that's resulted for for me is that a kind of continual sort of slight walking back of my argument, a continual kind of softening of my argument that I've had to engage with over the last two, three years, just simply to, you know, as we are all constrained, if any of us are also academics, as I know some of us are, you know, right, we are also constrained by having to publish in order to get positions in order to move forward in our careers. Um, and so I definitely have felt that sort of that sort of tension uh, where I've I've had to really walk back my position uh, and you know and, and and arrive more at a kind of yeah a, a sort of slightly more subtle uh, if anything sort of looking after the feelings of, of doctors position that I take which is actually sort of look after this their position their, their feelings and be like well you're not all bad um your class position is is this but this does not mean that you are bad um and so I, I think I I have actually had to do that um because generally my experience has been that medicine and doctors are not, um, yeah, they're not, 
then they don't want to engage with this. They don't, because they work really hard, because they are dealing with very difficult situations, because they are providing healthcare, they don't actually generally want to engage with the fact that perhaps the way that they're doing it is, uh, in fact, as you say, I, I would say is reproducing various class antagonisms, certainly through the ways in which like the, the, the kind of various, um, you know, forms of oppression are upheld within medicine, ability being one of them, race being another, gender being a third one. You know, there are loads of different forms of class-based antagonisms that are reproduced, produced, created and upheld through the process of medicine and medical science, medical education. Um, generally, they don't want to deal with that. Um, so, and that's the point that Catherine just made in the chat is like very true. Medicine in the UK has become an institution that's above critique. So you can, you can only really support medicine uh, but and I would say you, yeah, I would fully agree with that. You cannot really critique it, um, apart from if you're critiquing the fact that it's becoming more privatized. That's the, really the only thing that you can really critique in medicine in the UK. Um, so um, yeah, I think that's um, a, a challenge that I will face um, basically. <laughs> Thank you so much, Luke. Really appreciate. It. Looking forward to your talk next time. Yeah, that that was just a wonderful answer thank you so much and yeah nicola if you want yeah yeah and good luck leonard in defending your position because your work is just just amazing and i'm sure there will be different outlets that will be interested in in, in different perspectives you will provide you know, of course you have your you will be speaking to different people so yeah, and i'm yeah. sure different people will be needing different perspectives so yeah, so so good luck and yeah, just take care, care Thank of you so much. on your work. Yeah, yeah, Nicola. Thank sorry. you. Yeah, I think that's a, an important sort of nuance around um, that you've just mentioned about, you know, if you criticise uh, medicine in the UK, you know, we can't afford that. We've got to defend, 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 and of course, um, we do. But we're coming at it from the point of view of saying the reason the NHS is so vulnerable and under such attack and um, so distorted and so um, not able to respond to the needs of people is because it's been set up um, in a market orientation and right from the beginning. And the, it's vulnerable, it's always been vulnerable to that. And so we, our criticisms come from, um, that awareness and it's it's important to get that awareness into our arguments without sounding like we don't support it and it, it's hard but it's we have to do it and it is possible it's not a quick answer um but i was just going to say there's a bit in the chat about independent living and it sort of comes out of that whole thing of resilience and um the idea that um people are um you know uh, uh, just waiting for the moment where they can just sort of not have you know be lazy give up and make everybody else do everything for them and um I just I, I live near King's College Hospital in South London and um they had outside the A&E a big banner which said we're not gonna kiss it better and I honestly felt like I wanted to just march in and say, take that fucking ding. That is so insulting to every single person in the locality. The idea that people are like little babies that haven't got a clue. Um, it was so, I, th I thought it was appalling. Um, I'm sure pr uh, medical practitioners uh, didn't like it either. Um, you know, and it was manager's idea, but just to insert that, you know, that it can get that bad, the ideological uh, position of medicine towards working class people. Definitely, 100%. Yeah, I really agree. And, and yeah, that kind of example, I didn't see that particular one. Um, I'm also in South London, which is fun. Um, uh, but um, I didn't see that one. But um, there have been lots of examples like that that I've seen. The, the way that doctors talk about patients sometimes is just truly appalling. Um, um, yeah, which again is, you know, I, you know, I even feel the necessity to kind of defend them even as I'm critiquing them, which is, I think, really interesting. But um, obviously, it's not all doctors. But um, th there is the, the way that some doctors 
and medicine as a whole kind of views the patient is really um really part of the problem um and and i argue comes from this like primary constriction of the the value form and the, the profit motive so um yeah that's kind of kind of my my argument and um, i also have to shoot off if anyone has like one or more one more question if anyone like to say anything or I, or I can wrap up now cool thank you so much just to like say thank you to everyone who has commented and, and given me feedback like this is so helpful and useful to me at like the stage of my PhD, I, I feel like a um like a tiny baby um learning to walk. Uh, um but um yeah I really really appreciate um yeah really appreciate this space and all of the comments that people have given me. Um I feel like I'm gonna be able to use them to to put something uh to improve my work even more, which is just great. And I'm I'm so grateful to this to this space.